In October 1966, a meeting at the home of Frank Baker in Lincoln, Nebraska, focused on challenges within the growing beef performance program industry. The meeting between Baker, Ferry Carpenter, Charlie Bell, and Dell Dearborn set the early tone for hard yet honest discussions on the subject. At the time, there were conflicts between state programs, breed associations, and Performance Registry International, or PRI. Those conflicts pointed to the need for an industry-wide meeting to focus on performance programs and how those programs might be improved and coordinated. Ferry Carpenter offered that PRI would sponsor such a meeting in January 1967 during the opening weekend of the National Western Stock Show. I got started at BIF at the first meeting they ever held. Uh, Dr. DeBaca, I was a board member of the uh, Iowa Beef Improvement Association, uh, one of the very successful BCIAs, as they were called then. And, and uh, Bob DeBaca, Dr. DeBaca, suggested that I attend this meeting held during the Denver Livestock Show, which was being hosted by Ferry Carpenter. And Ferry Carpenter was a very successful lawyer and a very successful Hereford breeder from Colorado. Ferry Carpenter was the most interesting person. Of course, I, could, can, I can't tell you nearly as much about Ferry Carpenter as many other people uh, can tell you that you're going to in interview, but Ferry Carpenter was a lawyer, <laughs> a country lawyer, but a very, very good lawyer. Hayden, Colorado was his home. He had a ranch, bred horned Hereford cattle, and that was uh, really what Ferry Carpenter loved was apparently that ranch and those horned Hereford cattle. The people that were influential was PRI, which was a a uh, consortium of purebred breeders who wanted their seed stock to be measured on performance data rather than pedigree. The BCIAs, which were a part of the extension service of, of most universities, and then the breed associations who were just starting to adopt performance programs. And uh, there was leadership in, in all the groups, the Corbin brothers and uh, Jerry Linton in the Charlet Association in, in PRI. There was uh, Henry Gardner and, and Clarence Birch in the Angus Association and Ferry Carpenter. Uh, but there was a lot of leadership in all three organizations. At that time, it was a pretty slim group. It was basically made up of extension people. Uh, breed association people were very, not very evident, and when they were, they usually sat in the back of the room, and uh, there was a few of us in AI, um, Ray Woodard, who was at ABS, and Bernard Jones, that was at Curtis at that time, and me, we were basically the people out of the AI industry that was involved with BIF. At the end of this session, in that afternoon, a uh, committee of volunteers uh, chaired by uh, Frank Baker of the University of Nebraska met to uh, talk about the possibility of combining current state performance testing associations and other performance agencies into an overall national organization. And as a result of this meeting, January of 1967, the Beef Improvement Federation was formally organized exactly 12 months later in January 1968 and this in my opinion gave real life and vitality to the performance movements. The one thing is that we came out of there is we needed to have a federation, a federation of organizations that would standardize the inputs that we had in the commercial industry. At the end of the January 1967 meeting, the seeds of the Beef Improvement Federation were sown. A unanimous vote formed the national organization, which was comprised of the current performance testing organizations and agencies. It was determined that this national organization should have whatever functional power that members considered appropriate. Frank Baker, Charlie Bell, and Bob DeBaca formed the core of the ad hoc committee charged with determining the appropriate structure of the fledgling organization. A committee structure was established, and the first major objective was to develop standards for beef cattle performance testing that could be adopted nationally. I often ask, uh, you know, where would the seed stock industry be today if it was not for BIF? I think that's a really, really good question. And 
back before BIF, you know, it was the eye of the master fat in the cattle. And then technology brought us to objective measurements. And had they not, had this technology not been used or dispersed through a group like BIF, then I think the seed stock industry would really miss this nucleus of people that have really made significant changes and movements in direction of beef cattle uh, improvements. One of the problems you had with all the different beef cattle uh, extension groups, some in, in Georgia might be adjusting them totally different than they were being adjusted in Ohio or wherever. So you had a lot of problems as to how they got adjusted and that was one of the biggest things was getting the adjustments the same across the country and for the different breeds and all those kind of things. Of course, in the early years of, uh, of the BIF organization, standardization was the big thing. Getting standard terminology that everybody could use was, was the big thing. Then we'd have a yearling weight committee and a weaning weight committee and they'd play around with all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, we had to start from base zero. And, uh, of course, you know, this particular area of the country had done it one way. And by God, that's the way they wanted it done. So I remember one time I, I made a motion on the bull test committee that we shrink the bulls at least uh, 48 hours before we weighed them. I made the motion, had it seconded, and then I ran out of the room, went back an hour later, and they were still fighting about it. While developing standards, there was much debate and deliberation, and at one point, Bob DeBacher remarked that change is first made by making people think. Finally, after much thinking and compromise, the guidelines for uniform beef improvement programs were first published in 1970. But even after the guidelines were published, not everyone in the industry was ready to embrace the changes. Well, there was a, a big shift in extension uh, yeah, good point. Uh, where uh, the old time extension agent spent most of his time with shows and uh, with judging and that kind of thing. Whereas uh, the uh, shift in going to um, a record system has been a significant change and, and requiring different types of people. Is it meant changing? Anything that means changing is difficult for any big organization. They had their way of doing things and they had their people in place and so on. So it meant changing all that. And the people who were good at what they were doing were not necessarily any good at this. I mean, most people, you know, when, when, you, when you got down to talking about a ratio, like a weaning weight ratio, they, they kind of fought that idea, really. A lot of them did. Because they wanted to talk about how big that calf was and how much he weighed, and that's all they really maybe wanted to know about him. Since the first guidelines were released in 1970, a total of eight editions have been published. With the historical BIF guidelines providing a framework, new technologies have been incorporated, mostly through the hard work of new committees that were formed as BIF evolved. I see BIF as uh, kind of putting a guardrail on either side of the road. Uh, to keep us out of the ditch. And I go back far enough to remember when we ran out of the ditch with these baby beef belt size two-year-old cattle. And, and then uh, it's like so often you hear today about an accident, they overcorrected and ran out the ditch on the other side and there was a nine plus frame pole heifer bull made national champion while I was on the board. I started, I started with BIF, I guess, more on an official basis in about 1982 when I um, uh, was elected to the Board of Directors. And um, at the time, I was uh, Director of Research and Education with the American Pulled Herford Association and was fortunate enough at a fairly early age to, to get elected to the board. Shortly after uh, that, I would say probably in 83 or 84, we actually started the Systems Committee. And uh, that was a committee that was created to try to help encourage people to consider selection outside of uh, single trait selection. The other thing that's been a real challenge is the carcass thing. And you know, a few years ago, uh, and I give John Crouch a lot of credit because he chaired the committee that worked on uh, the ultrasound business. 
Many people, including myself, thought, well, maybe ultrasound is pie in the sky that'll never, you know, never turn out to be something that we can really use. But look what's happened. Uh, that's a working program. The, the guidelines are used in many, many different ways. Uh, whether it's um, in the early years, it was as simple as uh, using 205 day weights to use that as a genetic predictor and be able to evaluate commercial cow herds and, and, uh, and genetics uh, in, in two ultimately more sophisticated material. But I'll use one that we've used recently is disposition has a huge impact on carcass quality. Uh, that surprised us. We did not expect that particular genetic element to be uh, a, a impactor of carcass quality, we went back and used the BIF guidelines to then establish a criteria for statistical analysis of the data and let us really interpret uh, how dramatic the impact was of disposition on carcass quality. One could always count on the annual BIF meeting to challenge the attendees to look at industry issues from differing perspectives. Often, an entire meeting would be devoted to new topics and old techniques within the industry. Varied opinions have always been welcomed, and no one has ever said the annual meetings have lacked for a controversial topic or two. I don't know, though, in fairness to BIF, that I could uh, zero in on one thing and say that, in hindsight, that was a recommendation that later on we had to go back and, uh, and modify. I think we've modified many predictors, genetic predictors, but we've modified them as additional technology and information became available. And... Uh, you know, certainly one of the, the, the early controversies would clearly have been ultrasound. I mean, it's hard to, to uh, uh, and, and yet I think the, the approach that BIF took to utilizing ultrasound to make it a part of genetic predictions was very, very valuable to the industry. But some of those early years, that was uh, certainly a debatable topic. But in fairness, I don't know it was more debatable than other topics, because each year it seemed there was a hot topic at BIF. You know, one controversy I remember was was going way back to the, the, the frame score issue. You know, should BIF actually be responsible for printing or reporting uh, an official frame score? Because a lot of folks thought that's merely, you know, if we report a frame score, that's us endorsing frame score, and they were concerned about the fact that we might actually be endorsing single trait selection for frame score. The one meeting that stands out for me, and I had virtually no involvement in the debate or the discussion, was the one where we first openly debated, at least to my best of my knowledge, openly debated the use of F1 bulls. And I can remember the, the emotion and the passion that both sides brought to that debate and discussion. And when you reflect back on that particular meeting and you see how the industry has evolved since then and the tremendous amount of uh, effort currently being put into composites and F1s by the seed stock industry. It's, that one sticks out in my mind. Probably the most controversial uh, thing that I know of, uh, first of all, was whether we were going to use phenotypic data, weaning weight, rate of gain versus ratios. Uh, that was uh, that was n not as controversial as the introduction of EPDs because the introduction of EPDs represented a new era where 95% of the people in the audience did not understand the methodology towards it. When you deal with um, genetic prediction equations, uh, you're always dealing with controversy. Uh, you know, the, the early years when Dr. Willem and many other folks started formulating some of the predictive equations, there were many that really questioned their value and, and their accuracy. And, uh, and of course, we always have lines of cattle that we all have as our favorites. And sometimes these lines didn't shake out real well in these genetic prediction equations. So I, I think there were always controversies about the accuracy. Uh, one that comes to mind was when we started predicting milk uh, and formulating milk EPDs. I remember the debate. Uh, that, um, that these equations were not accurate. Many of the others were based a lot on actual weights, uh, the birth weight, weaning weights, yearling weights, but milk was formulated in a little different context. And, and some of these early ones came across with a lot of debate, but that's the great thing about BIF is it's always provide a forum for expressing opinions. And ultimately out of that, I think they've come up with very sound guidelines based on a sound group of people that formulated those decisions. For many, the annual research symposium and meeting provided time to rekindle a personal spark and passion for the performance aspects of the beef industry.
it really got the producers really interested and it it really took off they were looking for more information i think and what better place to get that to join a outfit like bif i suppose uh initially we did not have as many producers as it grew into uh, more of them were the professional people the uh, land grant university animal scientists the breed representatives the ai studs and probably my greatest appreciation was to get to know these people on a first name basis and the ability to pick up the phone and 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 visit with them over some of the issues that whether they developed out of BIF or, or whether they just had a question you needed answered. One of the first things BIF did is they give awards for continuing service and the Seed Stock Breeder of the Year Award. And this award become one of the most coveted awards that any seed stock breeder can, can receive to this day. And uh, some of the early me members of that Seed Stock Breeder of the Year was uh, Mrs. R. W. Jones of Pold Hereford fame, uh, uh, Carlton Corbin, who received the award while I was president, and uh, this brought the association together because uh, these giants of the giants of the seed stock industry, uh, the breed associations and the BCIAs and all these other organizations, wanted to nominate the best candidate they could because they thought it reflected very well on their organization, and it did, and it continues to this day. Another major objective of Beef Improvement Federation was to develop a means of reporting summaries of important beef cattle research to the membership. And this has been accomplished through BIF's annual meetings. And to me, as a university extension specialist, the annual BIF meeting is truly the most valuable conference that I have an opportunity to attend each year. And I attend, I attend a lot of meetings, but there's nothing like BIF. The closest thing may have been a special session at a NCA meeting, National Cattlemen Association meeting or, or something, but really not. Because these meetings, as I say, pull the industry together, pull the breed associations together, pull the breeders together, and with them pull the, pull the uh, extension and research uh, land grant university types together. And, and this is the only place where I was aware that this happened. And I think that was some of the magic in it. The big thing at BIF is all the people you get to talk to. Now we've got a lot more people to talk to than we did the first few years. Because the first years we were at 100, 125 people for BIF, where these last few years, we've been in the five, six, and seven hundred kind of deals. I think the biggest thing that the Beef Improvement Federation has accomplished was the pulling together of like-minded people, whether they were industry representatives, scientists, or producers, that wanted to utilize genetic information and knew we could make genetic progress. And that kind of mindset formulated the early years of beef, the Beef Improvement Federation and led to that, uh, that organization then having a tremendous impact on both providing educational material to the beef industry, training to the beef industry on things like uh, the estimated breeding values, the expected progeny differences, and certainly the role that it's playing now in DNA. It's become kind of the body that, that creates the guidelines for genetic improvement, but those early years were very formative in having the kind of leadership and foresight they had. It's been a 40-year uh, a think tank session that's brought together some of the, the deepest minds, if you will, about uh, where the beef cattle industry really needed to evolve to from a genetic prediction perspective. You know, that's one thing about BIF is that it's a different organization in that we didn't fight over money and things like that typically that I remember. Uh, what I really enjoyed about my, my participation in the Board of Directors is it was a group of people that came together for a common cause. And you had an a eclectic group, so to speak, of breed association representatives, seed stock producers, uh, extension and research folks from academia, and uh, commercial producers. 
And it's one of the few organizations in the beef industry, and probably the only one, that has that kind of mix of people. If you want to look at maybe the most important thing that uh, BIF has done, and you can cite many, many, many things, but this whole movement through BIF has brought groups together. It's been an organ of communications, the communications between breeds, the communications between state groups, the communication between the industry uh, and the land-grant university system, be it uh, research or extension. Uh, it's been, it opened up a whole area of communication. Looking toward the future, BIF indeed gives us the foundation to tackle emerging technologies, evaluate market trends, and debate new controversies. I think it's, it's going to be a place where, you know, we're going to have to raise cattle probably on a little more forage than we have in the past. And that presents a whole new um, array of questions and answers. You know, can we use the same test procedures uh, for a uh, high concentrate diet and apply them to all forage diets? Or maybe we need to readjust different things. And that coupled with the genomics is going to be a real, it's going to be very challenging. But I think very rewarding and very exciting. When I first started attending BIF, one of the, the real attractions of the meeting was the relatively small size and the tremendous amount of interaction that occurred among the scientists, producers, and industry support people. And I've heard over the last couple years, many of those have gone to a lot of these meetings lamenting at the increase in the size of BIF and some of the loss of, of opportunities for those interactions. And I guess as I think historically about where BIF has been and where it's going, it is still the meeting of the year for those interested in beef cattle selection and genetics and the application of technologies to those processes. And I hope people ignore the size and continue to be as interactive as they've been in the past. There's just more of us to share. It's been 40 years since Ferry Carpenter, Frank Baker, and other visionaries sat in a meeting in Denver in 1967 and changed the future of the beef industry. They faced the challenges of incorporating new ideas, embracing diverse opinions, and disseminating relevant research results. And they created an organization that has accomplished a great deal. Can we challenge ourselves as members of this organization to hold true to the spirit and purpose held by the founders back in 1967? What lies ahead, and what progress can be made in the next 40 years? These are questions we can only answer together as members of the Beef Improvement Federation.